everybody. Welcome back to Fertility Factor Fiction. We are live again, bringing you all of the latest and greatest in infertility for you to understand and learn about. And we are going to be sharing with you some really interesting information on um, AMH and IUI and whether it's predictive or not, and subgrouping of patients in there as well and uh, we'll answer all your questions live. So I'm uh, very happy to be back. Thank you for joining us. Um, we always uh, just chit chat for a minute while everybody jumps on board and uh, give everyone a time to uh, grab a tea or a coffee or whatever you're having and uh, join us. So <clears throat> hopefully you've all been safe and well. Um, the uh, pandemic, depending on where you are, is affecting everybody differently. Um, the the U.S. was the uh, the pariah of uh, the world for the longest time, and now they're doing an incredibly good job of vaccinating everyone. So the rates are going down, whereas in Canada, um, where we are now back into lockdown, we are not doing a great job. So uh, if you're uh, staying safe, thank God. Uh, hopefully all of you are taking all the precautions that you can. A lot of people have been asking us with the new lockdown if fertility is going to be locked down again, and the answer is no. Uh, there will be no fertility lockdown. We should be okay. Um, there should not be any problems with that. Uh, when we first locked down and shut down the fertility uh, world in Canada, the decision was not to do that again. Um, so we don't think we're going to be seeing that happen again, even during these lockdowns. And this current lockdown in Ontario is short-lived. It's only for a few weeks. So uh, with some luck, we'll come out of it after that. So in regards to uh, tonight's topic, um, we are going to be chatting uh, about the value or predictive value of AMH, um, anti-malarian hormone, uh, in terms of outcomes with um, uh, ovarian stimulation. And these were in exclusively in ovulation induction cycles with IUI. Um, so in other words, they were doing uh, shots and then they were using uh, IUI and then they were using the AMH level to see if it was predictive or not. Are we all good? Yeah. So um, with all of that in mind, um, I'll get right into the study. So this is an upcoming study uh, that will be presented in Fertility and Sterility, which is probably number two in the world for fertility journals. Um, human reproduction is number one. So they looked in a retrospective study, so they were looking back in time at existing data, and they went from 2007 to 2019. They looked at 1,861 cycles where the patients were getting shots to help promote egg growth, and they had an AMH level. So they took the AMH levels and they broke it down into what we call quartiles. And then they took the quartiles and split it into three groups. So there was less than the 25th percentile, 25 up to 75, and then greater than 75. So to give you an idea of what those numbers were, it was 0 0.7 nanograms per mil or less, which is roughly five picomoles per liter. It was... Um, between that 5 to 31.4 or 0 0.7 to 4.4 uh, um, for the higher end, uh, or sorry, for the middle end. And then the higher end was obviously above 31.4 um, or 4.5 nanograms per mil. So 31.5 and above and 4.4 uh, if you're in the nanograms per mil range. So they used those as the stratification to analyze the, da the data. And then they went back and they took a look at everybody. So who did they include? They included patients that were doing insemination and had um, a reasonably normal sperm count. So the total sperm count, uh, motile sperm count, had to be over 1 million per mil. So, you know, obviously that's very severe male factor if you're down to 1 million per mil. But that was their definition. And they said that at least one fallopian tube had to be open, obviously. Um, there were, uh, all, all cycles were done out of one center, which was uh, Mass General uh, Hospital Fertility Center in Boston. And um, they basically included all of those patients. The ones that were excluded were obviously patients that did not meet those criteria or did not have an AMH available. So there were actually 
around 5,000 people that qualified, um, but only uh, 1,861 of them actually had an AMH level at the time. And this is probably because looking back 13, 14 years ago, it was not as common to do AMH back then. So um, the first thing that they looked at was the demographics between the groups. So I wanna kind of familiarize you with that so you understand where things kind of shook out. So in the low AMH group, uh, average age was 37.9. Um, in the medium one, it was 36.3. And in the high, it was 33.6. And obviously that makes sense because the higher AMHs are gonna be in younger patients, the lower ones in older patients. Um, BMI, these were actually fairly lean patients compared to what we would typically see. So the average BMI in the low uh, category was 25.9, the middle 25.0, and the high 24.6. So um, I can tell you that we rarely see patients in those BMI categories. So how applicable this is to the um, greater population uh, is questionable because the BMI is a lot lower. Um, half or so of the patients had already been pregnant in the low group. Um, roughly 44% if almost 45% in the middle group and only 37% in the high group. And then in terms of the amount of drugs and so on, obviously the lower group required more drugs, the higher group less. Um, estrogen levels were fairly close, but statistically different when they analyzed them. <coughs> Excuse me. And then when they looked at the actual follicle numbers, it was 1.7 in the low group, 1.9 in the middle group, and 1.6 in the high group. So average number of follicles were pretty close to one another. Um, and then when they looked at the live birth rates, they did not see a statistically significant difference, um, but you can see that there is a difference there in terms of the numbers. So 56.8 overall in the low group, 74.4% uh, in the middle group, and 64.4% in the high group. So let's take a look at um, some of the numbers here. So if you go to figure 1A, um, you should be seeing what's called a, a Cox um, uh, progression uh, model and um, or a Kaplan-Meier uh, failure function test. So um, these basically demonstrate over time what your rates are and you'll see those steps in the graph there. So in the total population, the patient group that was in the low category had a 14.2% cumulative success rate by the time they got to six cycles. So if your AMH is under five and you are trying IUI, you can expect that within six cycles, you're gonna get a 14.2% um, clinical pregnancy rate. So that's not live birth, it's just clinical pregnancy. Remember that some of those will miscarry. Um, between the moderate to high group, uh, it was anywhere from a low of about 14 all the way out to about 25% um, roughly. So their average was uh, about 17.4 between those two groups. So, uh, uh, you know, anywhere from a 3 to almost an 11% spread. They then went and looked at just the patients without PCOS. And when they looked at the patients without PCOS, it is statistically significant in the group that had um, the high compared to the group that had the low, but the middle group actually did not make a difference when there was no PCOS. So that's figure 1B. I think you're on that one already. If you go to figure 1C, this was the group with PCOS. So interestingly here, inside the PCOS group, even though they did demonstrate um, fairly high variations and what that's what that colored spacing indicates there actually is not a statistically significant difference between the three groups so if you walked in with pcos your chances of clinical pregnancy statistically speaking were the same between the medium the high and the low group it made no difference um, the final one that you'll see is 1d and in this one, they used different reference ranges rather than their own quartiles. They broke it up into uh, quartiles from a different, uh, a different paper, and it went anywhere from um, the middle one being less than 0 0.7, which was their own, or sorry, the low one, the middle one being 0 0.7 to 8.4, so almost double their range, 
and then greater than 8.4. And in that model, both the middle and the high are statistically significantly higher. Now, just to give you an idea of the actual numbers, <clears throat> if you look at just the total population with their original quartiles, if you're in the middle group, you have a 55% higher chance of pregnancy than the low group. If you're in the high group, you have a 70% higher chance of pregnancy. When they went down to this new assessment, it was 54% in the middle group compared to the low group, but it was 111% higher chance if you're in the high group because they really have a very, very strong AMH level. I mean, uh, uh, 8.4 nanograms per mil AMH level is, is very, very high. Those are your very strong PCOS patients usually. Okay, so the other element of this that they evaluated was the miscarriage rate. So we'll look at table three. Now, this is a bit of a good news, bad news scenario if you look at this table. So you'll see two columns there. One says unadjusted and the other one says adjusted. So what are they adjusting for? They're adjusting for risk factors such as age, BMI, smoking status, and so on. So when they did the unadjusted rates, if you were in that less than 10th percentile, you had a statistically significant increase in miscarriage. In all the other ones, because the confidence intervals you'll see cross the number one, so there's, they're going from a decimal to a full number, you can see that none of those are statistically significant because once you cross one, there is no relationship. So it didn't show it, but the, so the, the bad news there is in the unadjusted, meaning uncontrolled for confounding variables or risk factors, they are suggesting that if you're in the low category, you have a higher miscarriage rate. But when they adjusted for those risk factors, it all fell off because there is no significance when it crosses one. And as you go down through the various group comparisons, none of them maintain significance in either the adjusted or the unadjusted, um, except for, again, the first one with the first stratification total population. When they look at their low group, it is a much higher risk. But then again, when they did the adjustment for it, it was not statistically significant. Now, interestingly, when they go into their discussion, they keep saying that there was a higher risk of miscarriage. But statistically, that's actually incorrect. So I have no idea how that got you know, past the publishers or the, the uh, guys that um, evaluate the articles. But the reality is there is no statistically significant increase if you cross that um, one number, because that means that the stats aren't actually valid. It might be a trend, but it's not actually statistically significant. So can you use your AMH to predict success? You can. The AMH level that you determine prior to your IUI cycle can give you a, an idea of how successful you will be, right down to percentages within six months of use because you've got those numbers like 14, um, you know, 17, all the way up to 24, 25%. So you can actually predict what your success will be. There's a couple of really important points to take away from this. Number one, it can take multiple tries of IUI, six, for example, in this study, just to get to a 14% success rate. So people frequently will do IUI and say, why isn't it working? Well, it can take a lot of tries just to get a very low percentage chance overall. So keep in mind, that's a cumulative chance of 14% overall when you're trying with the IUI after six months. The second thing to know is that your chances are reasonable if you keep at it because their overall live birth rates were fairly high. So obviously as these patients went on and on, they did end up having live births. So you gotta kind of analyze all of this data carefully, but understand that the AMH can actually be predictive. And this is one of the few studies that has actually demonstrated this because traditionally no one has been able to show that AMH will predict live birth but this one actually seems to be predicting at least clinical pregnancy. And while we don't have IVF data that supports that, it's likely coming. Um, and this is, again, a useful tool. Do we measure everything by AMH? No. Does a low AMH mean you cannot get pregnant? No, of course not. Some of these patients are getting pregnant. But it is a useful tool to help us guide you and give you the information you need. So thank you for joining us for Fertility Factor Fiction. We love doing this segment of the show, and we are uh, happy to have you join us for this. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe.